Um, many thanks to the Director of um, the Federal Office of Culture and to Kunst Museum Basel, our two primary partners. Um, I didn't realise that the Director of uh, the Federal Office of Culture had studied mathematics, um, so I hope he notices in our logo is a set of Bernoul Bernoulli spirals, uh, Bernoulli being one of uh, Basel's many great mathematicians, um, which guided our artwork there. Um, okay, uh, I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to dwell on introductions, so they're all in your handbook. Um, it's a great, uh, we, we're flipping first and last uh, because of technical issues. So first up will be Gerd Leonard uh, from Basel. Uh, he's a very famous guy outside of Switzerland in digital media, has made a name for himself many times with his repeated uh, prescient predictions about the role and direction of digital media. Um, it's a good thing that he's not charging us his corporate rates to be here because uh, we, he wouldn't be here otherwise. But uh, please welcome Gerd Leonard. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Bonjour. Salamat pagi. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm now a native Basler. I've just received my Swiss passport. So if I speak about Switzerland, I have now the authority to make fun of Switzerland because I'm actually a native. Uh, if you are on Twitter, I'm G. Leonhard on Twitter. You see it right here. And my German tweets are Der Futurist. Uh, many of you may wonder what in the world a futurist is. There's really no good German word. There's a good French word, la perspective, which is, describes it well. I think about what's coming in the future three to five years from now. I don't do predictions. I deal with foresight. Okay, foresight is what everybody has. There's a Chinese saying that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. So that's really what it's all about. I try to remain a child in that way and speak to my clients about the future. We work with hundreds of companies. My company is called The Futures Agency, based in beautiful Hollisheim. And this was some time ago. You know, I actually have something to do with culture and creativity. I, I'm not just a speaker, but you know, thankfully the world hasn't been relieved of my activities as a musician. Um, it's great to have this event in Switzerland. As you can see, Swiss people are very inventive. Um, so it's really good to have that here and kick things off. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the network society. Now, what, what we have today is really absolutely mind-boggling. When I started on the internet in 1995, my first project was together with the Internet Underground Music Archive in Santa Cruz, California. And we thought that five years later, Napster, right, everybody is going to get music on the internet, wasn't true, it was too early. And all of us went bankrupt in 2002 because of this. It's a great experience to try it sometime. But now we have the network society is real, right? We have mobile devices, the whole world is connected, we're going to have five billion people connected to the internet. There's a huge amount of cultural change coming with this. Not all of it is good, of course, you know, like the nuclear power, which by and large is not good, can be used for good purposes, but also for bad purposes. But we have to remember one thing, today in this society, in network society, we're no longer in these silos, you know, we're no longer about art, society, politics, business, IT. We're actually putting this together, digital culture really knows no silos. And if you're in the business community, you have to deal with art, if you're artists and artists, you have to deal with business and, and technology. And many solutions to cultural business uh, affairs and, and issues are going to be in the ICT technology business, you know, with telecoms and ISPs. So, uh, I don't know if this actually exists, it's called a sheep pig. But I think we have a new breed of culture that's emerging. I'm very excited about this because I think this culture is going to be changing a lot of things and it's, you know, I call this a network culture. Here you see in Israel a fun park where you go down the slide and you can post your image on Facebook using a wristband. Right? You can go down the slide and it will post your picture on Facebook. Uh, here you can share your songs on Facebook if you're listening to Spotify. You can comment everywhere. You can publish your running data using the Nike shoe. I don't know if any of you are doing this, but if you're into working out, you can publish the data. Millions of people are doing this. You can raise money on Kickstarter. There's been 35,000 projects funded on Kickstarter, including Amanda Palmer for, as you can see, for $600,000 almost. You can print 3D uh, images and create your own shoes from like a, like a copy machine now in 3D. And there's lots of confusion. Right? And digital culture and network culture is not a quiet place, right? 
Twitter makes me like people I've never met, and Facebook makes me hate people I know. This is really quite confusing. So, I mean, this is the kind of culture we live in today. But I think the very good thing is that for the creative industries, for creative people, and for the cultural, so-called cultural industries, terrible name, but we're jumping down to a larger fishbowl. This is a whole different world because there's a larger audience, there's a way to connect, and uh, the investor in Facebook, the investor, Kleiner Perkins, calls this social law, social, local, mobile. This is the world we live in. If you're here today, you can check in using a check-in app like Foursquare or Facebook and find out who is here. You can connect with people. Very soon you can go to the football game, find each other in the audience, send messages, exchange images, and it's mind-blowing. But here's the thing, we're going from a paper culture to a screen culture. Just talk to the newspapers about what that means, right? Screen culture, I mean, the newspaper is now just another screen. I mean, the printed newspaper is a screen, basically a printed screen. So that makes a huge difference for business models. Uh, there's a great research study from Google showing that we're moving into a mobile and multi-screen world that is basically the majority of our media interactions are through screens. Which doesn't mean newspapers will die, but just being another screen is different than owning the screen. And that's a whole different business model. Many times we turn to the closest screen, TV no longer commands, of a sole attention. Actually, people are watching TV, but you know, at the same time, they're on their smartphones. I'm sure you do this right? on the iPad while you're watching television. The last Swiss music contest, or the Swiss music something, uh, 100,000 people twittering all the time. Right? They're not watching TV in the same sense that I did 40 years ago. Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine, calls this visuality. We're moving from orality from speaking to writing to images. This is fantastic news if you're a creator, right? because clearly a machine can't make a good image in the same way that a human would. Right? I mean, the, the creativity behind making visual things is human. Right? It can be done with machines, but it's not the same thing. And we have this complete convergence of internet and television. If you're in the TV business, the TV producer, this is your saving grace. Unlike the newspapers, it's going to be a lot easier for television people. Again, imagine 5 billion connected devices. I do a lot of work in Indonesia. Indonesian government is now putting online 16,470 items on white high-speed internet on the mobile phone. And these people never had radio before or television. They didn't have any video. They were singing, and now they can watch YouTube on the mobile phone. I imagine what that will do to people's culture, religion, in between becoming a connected device. The television knows who you are. Imagine the television actually knows who you are, what you like, what you look like. There's a new television coming out by Intel that scans your face while you're watching and figures out if you're old or young or happy or sad and changes the commercial. Imagine this, man. I mean, scary thought. But they're serious about this. I mean, I'm not joking, they're quite serious about this. So now we have what's called natural user interfaces, right? Kids love the iPad. I mean, you, you have tried this with your kids, I'm sure. But, you know, it's completely natural. Getting excited, so take my second off. Well, I'll keep it there, I promise. So, kids do this, right? But now what happens if kids can't do this? You see in this video, here's a kid who has a magazine, right? And this kid is trying to zoom the magazine. You know, but what this means in reality is that in this world, if you can't be zoomed, you don't exist. You're not of interest. <laughs> and here is the next television from Samsung. Voice control for television. Talking to your television and touching the screen from afar, right? Motion control. I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but it's, it's coming, right? Imagine what happens when we can touch the television and we can pull out data like in, one, in, the, in the Matrix. Huh? One of my favorite movies, of course. So now we have new interfaces. And some people, this is a scary thought, right? 
Some people are calling this my second brain. Right? The iPhone, especially the one that came out yesterday, right? if you use it, it becomes your external brain. I use an app called Wikiall. You can download Wikipedia. And every time you have an argument in the bar about how many people live in you know, North Korea or whatever, you just look it up. Right? It's an external brain. Think about a Wikipedia implant in your head. This is, this is coming, I'm not talking. You can have an implant for, for you know, hearing. You can have an Alzheimer's implant. Why not have a Wikipedia implant? Like, I mean, we have breast implants, we have a, well, we have a Wikipedia implant. So, now interfaces, right? Basically, Michio Kaku. The internet in your contact lenses. Now uh, this is kind of interesting, right? But I mean, uh, I could care less. I have to be honest. But uh, this is going to change our behavior. Google Glasses and all this way. Automatic translation will be with us in two years. I, I was in the Google Labs the other day. I spoke in German. It came out in Chinese on the other side, right? in real time. I mean, automatic translation is here. What will this do to Switzerland? Right? Will we still learn three languages? Um, it's really difficult to say. So the next challenge that we have to face in the cultural industries and being creators and, and in culture in general is about augmented reality, human-machine interfaces, artificial intelligence. All sounds like a Cory Doctor of novel, which I would highly recommend, right? But it's here, right? Singularity, right? The idea of having improved humans. Right? Check out this video about how we're going to be dating. Give us some more sound. Great. Thank you. The guy has an iris implant okay, to access the internet while he's talking. It's actually it's a uh, sports so it's a lot less official than us. What do you mean? Sorry? What's the difference between sports jacket and a normal one? Uh I guess sports jacket is for people with a little bit even when they taste other things. <laughs> so is that what, what is going to be in the future? I think with technology and, and with creativity we have to redefine what human actually means. What does it mean to be human? Does it mean we're going to be walking Depository of ad plugins. Yeah. I mean, this is a scary thought. But anyway, storytelling is changing, and many of us are storytelling, right? It's now called transmedia storytelling, using all kinds of tools to tell stories. And this is good news for, the, for creative people because all of a sudden we have audio, video installations, and we have data feeds, real time things, and all these things. Here's a clip from Bear 91, Bear, no, Bear 71, from the Canadian Film Board. A fully interactive film. We'll see some of that stuff today. Where you can see the journey of a bear. Now, this is a map I found just two nights ago when I was I was looking for a different worldview, and I found this. And this is a Kiwi, a New Zealand map of the world, right? It's turned around. Right? So that Australia and uh, Kiwi land is, is in the middle. Right? And I think what we're going to see in the future is that seeing things in new ways is going to be very important. Getting rid of our old assumptions. There's no better example which I love to talk about, the music business. The music business had the assumption for a long time that we have to control that people make copies of songs. That, that's the most important thing. Because we want to sell CDs and downloads. Reality is the music industry has shrunk 74% in 10 years based on this assumption. And they still haven't changed. We'll talk about that later. Marshall McLuhan in 1971 talked about the global village. This is what he said. You have extreme concern with everybody else's business and much involved in everybody else's life. It's a sort of an analysis called with large. And uh, it uh, does not necessarily mean harm to be quiet, but it does mean huge involvement. 
It doesn't necessarily mean harmony, peace, and quiet. We should take that literally, he means that's not. We love harmony, peace, and quiet, and that's good. Switzerland is a beautiful country for harmony, peace, and quiet. But this conversation about digital culture is not about keeping it quiet. We have to deal with a conversation that is rather complex. The crowd in the cloud, the connecting what people do in the, in the cloud with the crowd, that is a huge thing for the future and it's finally giving us that global village. Cloud computing, all of you guys know what that is. Huh? But really what's happening is here that my music, my films, my TV shows, my health records, my money, my education is moving into the cloud. There's an estimate that over two and a half million lives could be saved if the health records were in the cloud. So that the doctor in Costa Rica where you had a car crash can pull up your patient information. This is going to happen, cloud computing, but the global vision is not really about technology. Right? It's about what we do with all these things. How do we react? How do we change? How do we change what we do and how we do it? And I would submit to you that in terms of what's happening here is that trust is this new currency. Right? Trust is the only value that remains when it's about trusting an artist or trusting a business or trusting a company. And you see this trust economy unfolding, I think, pretty much across the board. In a network society like this, a society that's very fast moving and interconnected, all of you, I'm sure, are on LinkedIn. So what you do before you go to a meeting, you look up the person you're going to meet on LinkedIn. And that's, everybody does that now. You look at people up on Facebook to see what the latest post was. So we're now heavily interconnected, and really what matters here is curation because there's so much happening. This is the future role of broadcasters, of radio people, of producers, right? They're not becoming super fools, they're becoming curators. My new book is called From Ego to Ego, it's not out yet, so... Uh, and by the way, all of my books are free on the internet, so if you want to download my books, just Google GERD, free PDF, and G-E-R-D, and then you'll find it. So, we're now moving in, a, in cultural terms, we're moving from a society of egos, which I don't mean badly. Society of Disney's Universal Music's uh, Goldman Sachs. The society based on empires to a society of a biosphere. And I mean, if you look at what's happened, the most successful companies are interconnected companies. Google, eBay, Amazon, YouTube, Skype, Twitter, LinkedIn, Zing, Facebook. They're all becoming companies that are interdependent. Google couldn't exist without our collaboration. Facebook would be dead. We are the content of Facebook. If we don't participate, Facebook is dead. The difference between MTV and YouTube, so MTV was a corporate empire running the show, and YouTube was a network. There's nobody programming YouTube. We, we program YouTube. So now we're heading into uh, a, an era of what I call a biosphere, and ecosphere. So we're going from the ecosphere, you know, from large companies, from large corporations, to a biosphere. We're going to YouTube, to Spotify, and to electric vehicles. I mean, the regular carbon economy is an empire. But the future cannot be an empire because we have, we have reached the top of that ceiling to where we can go much further. I think what we're seeing in culture, especially in television and motion pictures and music is that control is moving to the nodes, you know, the individual parts are going from the central parts to the network. Okay, many of us don't really like this. I mean, clearly, if you're only on and you too, you're over here because you have a record to do with universal music. Would you like that to be a public license that you have over here? Probably not. Because clearly the control moves away from you. I mean, we're living in a society that used to be like this. This is not just for cultural industry, but now it's like this. <laughs> and, and the measure, of course, the other doesn't go away. Right? Clearly, we're going to have corporations and I mean, clearly. It's a fundamental change of direction, however. And what are we going to do about this? Are we going to go and say back, let's shut down the internet because we want those big fish to be back in power, right? It's not going to happen. I mean, we have to get used to a different business model. That business model says that we are the show. With we, I mean the creators and the consumers, so-called consumers. Not the industries. 
The industries are there to facilitate that conversation between the creator and the user, not to run it. So we're going to see entirely different cultural industries based on creating a connection between the creator. Right? Social media clearly is where this is already happening. A great new book came out, a friend of mine wrote a book called Lycanomics. If you want to read a good book, apart from mine, of course, you should read Lycanomics. Because he's talking about what happens when people like what you do, how you make money in being liked. And I would grant you, it was quite difficult to be liked as a bank. It's possible, I guess. And it's actually becoming more possible now. But Lycanomics is huge. It's a huge boom for creators because we can all of a sudden use this kind of reputation economy. This is a site called Cloud with a K that shows the social influence, the rating of people who use Twitter and Facebook. And if you have a rating of over 50, if you go to certain American hotels, they will look you up and they will give you an upgrade or a free airport pickup based on your cloud score. Right? Because they perceive you to be influential. But I think we also have to be aware of publicity overkill, you know, the overkill of constantly talking about it. It becomes sort of a curse, right? Because when you share a lot of things, you know, it's a perpetual motion of uh, friending and talking. We have to also be aware of that. I think in Switzerland we have a quite good balance on this, actually. And we should keep that, that we, you know, we don't end up being in a whole jail of social connections. This cartoon with the guy meeting the woman, he says, you look just like your profile picture. <laughs> This is also a kind of an interesting thing, you know, transparency is great to show who you are, but as creators we must retain some sort of mystery, right? It can't always be completely explicit. Right? There has to be something that we keep that is a mystery. And of course now we're heading into a society where, you know, offline is the new luxury. I remember that ten years ago we used to go to an hotel and they would charge you a lot to go online and they still do. Right? Now you can go to hotels, it'll cost you $50 a day for a guarantee that your mobile phone will not work. <laughs> they, they block it. You pay for that. So if you're really into luxury, you know, you should explore this. I think this is crucial, right? that we afford ourselves the luxury of disconnect. Because clearly the creation process does not work if you're always being sidetracked into other projects. Right? Very important, I think, uh, creativity, as my good friend Albert said, creativity is the residue of time wasted. You ever been to Burning Man? Who's been to Burning Man? Excuse me, come on. You guys know what Burning Man is? Okay. Well, it's kind of late to go there now, but you know. <laughs> this is me, I'm just kidding, this is not me. But, uh, it's a great example. We need to waste time to be creative. I mean, this is, we have to have the permission to waste time. This is why so many companies that I work with are not creative. Right? Because the minute of time you're wasted is immediately said, oh, this is, you know, that's why you're not allowed to go on Facebook in your company, because right? you're wasting time. Right? I mean, imagine that logic. That's the best way to kill the company, is to disallow people to be created. So here we have a particular problem today, is that we have broadband technologies, you know, making us faster, but we have narrow band minds. Here's a great example of a narrow band mind right here from Switzerland. The managing director of the IFPI, the Swiss uh, organization of the record labels, he said in a statement about the policy of Switzerland. You know, in Switzerland is illegal to download music, but not legal to upload music. Right? This is quite different. But he says about Switzerland, compared to the daily music consumption, the income is too low. Politicians still put up with the steady loss of jobs in the Swiss music business, the less fair attitude is not acceptable, leads to cultural flattening. So he is clearly somebody, which is not surprising, but he is clearly somebody who, who does not understand really how technology has changed, right? but the mind is still in a dial-up internet. He probably has his emails printed out. <laughs> but what's happening here is a cultural policy and what we decide, we've completely broken up the wrong tree. It's not about restriction, but about permission. It's about, not about control, but about engagement. I mean, as an artist, you would know this. 
If you're looking for control over everything that you've done, every picture, so you will not get engagement, you will not get trust, you will get nothing. But we also have been discussed at a global level and also been discussed in Switzerland, like SOPA, ACTA, PIPA, and other ACE. The internet builds to disconnect people, like we have in our neighboring France with Hadopi. Right? I mean, is there anything more ridiculous than this? These are culture and creative killers, these ideas, yeah? because they restrict the open network. We have to resist them. I would urge you, the Federal Office of Culture and other politicians, not to go down this direction. This is taken from the Wall Street Journal that had an article about the future of the film business. Yeah? And what they do here is they hide their roles of film while everybody else is popping up all over the place and creating other ways to watch their movies. Now let me ask you a simple question. 32 million Americans are subscribing to Netflix, which is a flat rate music service, for $10 a month. 32 million. How come the service isn't available on a global level? How come we don't have it in Switzerland or in India or in China? Right? Well, the answer is simple, because there's cable and satellite coverage. We're supposed to use that, because it makes more money. So when you think about this piracy, piracy is unmet demand. So this is very important for the cultural business because piracy is a driver. What we need is web-native business models, and uh, as this beautiful cartoon says, we can't fax a cat. We can't prevent people from doing what they want on the internet. If we want to do that, we have to become China. And even there, it's not working. So I would submit to you that traditional copyright is a burning platform, just like the BP platform here. It's a burning platform because neither the word copy nor the word right is something that is really relevant on the internet today because everything we do is a copy. You're listening to a YouTube statement, it's a copy. You can, you can convert YouTube, I'm sure you know about this, into MP3s. That's how people get music. Everything on the internet is a copy. So what are we going to do about this? We need a new platform. Here's an example of my colleague, Ross Dawson, from Australia, who's talking about the future of news. This may be interesting of some of you in the journalism business. Eh? And basically what's happening is here is that we're finding out that the value of news is not the report and the smart writing, that is of course the basis of it, but all the extras, the filtering, the interfaces, the relevance, the insight, the design, the reputation. I'll give you an example. I subscribe to The Economist. I don't really always like their opinions or their reporting, but I like their writing. But here's the only reason why I uh, spend $100 on The Economist a year. Because I can listen to the audio version of what they write in the car. Right? If they give you an app, you can download the app, you can listen to the audio while you're driving. That is the only reason. I don't have a subscription because I love what they write or how they write. I do. But I only have it for the audio. That's called added value. So we must learn in the cultural industry, in the cultural business, to build value around the content, not with the content, not just with the content. I call this a shift from paying wall to pay will. You know, the New York Times has a pay wall. You pay three hundred dollars a year. You'd have to be totally in love to pay three hundred dollars a year. Uh, which they have 800,000, which is a good love crowd, you know. But not, you know, America's 320 million people, so, you know, not really an accomplishment, I would say. But Netflix is pay will, and we're about pay more, it's a bad, bad thing. So the future of media is here. This is NASCAR on Twitter. Uh, NASCAR has a channel on Twitter now, using this hashtag, where they publish short movies and tweets, and this is becoming a TV channel. You guys know TED.com? Right? TED.com has 750 million views of their videos. They're bigger on the than the Discovery Channel. So the future of media is about real-time, peer-to-peer, distributed media. And uh, I'm going to wrap up pretty soon, because otherwise we'll be here in the evening. I won't be here anyway, but I won't be talking. But what's coming next? This is very, very important. I mean, we're not in Euroland here. We're about five miles away from Euro. But this is what's happening with money, right? We're moving into what's called sustainable capitalism. One form of capitalism that does not just use externalities to make money off. Right? And that's
And this has a lot to do with culture. <laughs> culture is the part that can make money also sustainable. We can learn from artists there how to be sustainable and not exploit the system. I think, of course, the reality is it'll be both the ego to ego and the money at the same time. So a quick uh, takeaway for you. Point number one. We're living in a network society. Refusal is useless. You can say, okay, you're going to go off the grid. You can be in the matrix or you, know, you can go under the grid. You can do that. Okay. But the benefit of a connected society will not be available to you if you choose to disconnect whenever you want to disconnect. But that's obviously not going to happen. So we have to learn how to live with this, what Marshall McLuhan calls chaos and noise. That is something that we have to learn how to filter. We're moving from an ego society to a biosphere, an ecosystem. If you're, if you're a creator, if you're in the cultural business, this is very, very good news. Because culture and creativity always has to do with having a network, with being connected. And this is also what businesses can learn from artists. How to actually now improvise, how to set things up. Another irrefutable trend that you know, consumer empowerment everywhere. Whoop, okay. Oh, it's still here, that's good. Okay, so we are the show. That means we are actually what's happening on Facebook. We are the show on Facebook. I mean, some people call Facebook a perpetual virtual reality show. That's very true. But if we weren't participating, there would be no Facebook. And we can actually we can make that happen if we want to. We can leave. Okay, so we are the show. Like a noise. This is the biggest leap in the creative industries that we've seen since the invention of the phonograph. Social, local, mobile. Take some time off. Use waste to uh, waste some time to be creative. And let's think about a new way how we're going to go forward with this. Let's think about inventing something. Okay, this is my final word of this. Turn it up a bit. Sorry, turn up the sound, please. Uh, this is too good to waste, you know, so I'm sorry I have to go into this and actually queue it up because. Okay, so my final message on this is. Mama always said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That's my final word, life is like a box of chocolate. Thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>